Greetings brothers, today we're going to be talking about 6 Blood Angels units that you should avoid fielding in competitive play in 9th edition. So thanks for being here and welcome to the weekly tactics video and today yes we are talking about 6 units that I feel really need to be improved if you want to see them in any sort of competitive play in 2022 and I'm going to get right into it and some of you guys might disagree with some of my options here but if you do you can leave me a comment down below and we can talk about it as to why you think this is a good unit and maybe I do not. So the only other thing to say I suppose is my experience tells me that I've played probably like 100 games of 9th edition now, I have a very very high win rate. I play a lot of different armies and I don't know how to include these units in my army list because I don't want to lose games. So tell me if you are using these units, how you're including them and how you're still grinding out those victories. But for me, I think all six of these units need a serious think about to see them back in the competitive scene. And I would like to see them in the competitive scene. Let me start by saying that. I would love to see these units in the competitive play. We just do not see them at all. Unit number one, and there's no surprise here, I think, is going to be Brother Corbulo. Brother Corbulo, to me, is a very confused unit. He's expensive in that he's 150 points. His Warlord trait doesn't synergize at all with his armor save. And part of the great thing about Gift of Foresight is how... You can get a re-rollable invulnerable save for free, uh, basically in your turn and the enemy's turn. So that's twice per battle round. It's a huge, huge value. However, it just doesn't work on Carbolo, in my opinion. And then his aura, in some ways, is actually kind of weaker than a regular sanguinary priest's aura. So I've written a few slides about each of these units, and here are my points. Sir Corbolo's aura is arguably less useful than the blood chalice that the sanguinary priest gets because your units need to stay within six of him, and that's not easy to do because he uses slow, and hence, because of the units needing to be within six, he cannot use it on a forlorn fury death company, which you can use the blood chalice on. So straight away, that kind of... Number one is a huge issue. It, it kind of makes him worse than the sanguinary priest straight away. Number two is, like I said, he's slow. Uh, obviously, you kind of want your priest to be able to keep up with your jump units to keep them alive. Corbolo cannot do that. So the only real way to reliably deliver him might be a drop pod. And, you know, if you are going to deliver him in a drop pod, he's possibly going to end up exposed if you fail a charge. You really don't want your apothecary exposed or even in combat. He's kind of should be handing him back, played strategically, and that's so much easier to do with the jump pack uh, Sangri priest. So... <laughs> Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Third, like I mentioned, his Warlord trait is worthless. Uh, Gift of Foresight is an amazing trait on any character that has like a reasonable invun, like a 4 plus uh, plus. On a character that can get like a 3 plus plus running armor and Domitus, it's an insanely good Warlord trait. But because Corbolo has no invulnerable save, it's typically, in my opinion, it's, it's no value at all. I think his Warlord trait should be that new one from the Space Marine Codex, the Selfless Healer, uh, which was that came in the 9th edition Space Marine Codex, and that would give him the zero CP combat revivals, which most people get with the Sanguinary Priest. Um, because he doesn't have that, again, he's worse than a regular Sanguinary Priest or an Apothecary, and because he doesn't have the Selfless Healer, he only heals D3, rather than the full 3 that the Priest or the Apothecary would do as well. So there's just so many bad points about Corbolo. Uh, and then he's only 5 points cheaper than the Sanguinary Priest with the Jump Pack. So... His stats and his profile just seem confused. He does have some positives. I mean, he's got an okay chainsword, but for some reason it doesn't have the plus one attack that other chainsaws have. Um, he can do the double heal because he has got that high priest uh, rule, and he does have one more wound than a sanguinary priest. And we did a tier list of all the Blood Angels elites. We actually did tier lists for every single Blood Angels uh, type of unit. And I wanted to go back and look at where I put them on the tier list and if I had any changes. So when I did the tier list with Mark and Tony, and I'll link some tier lists at the end of this video so you can jump into those tier lists if you haven't seen them before. Um, we rated it as a C, and my verdict is very much he is still a C, he is completely crap. Corbolo needs a complete overhaul. I don't know if he will ever be competitive if he doesn't have a jump pack. That's my opinion. If he's going to be Primaris, if he's going to go over the Rubicon, he needs to come back out the other side of the Rubicon with a jump pack, or you will never see him in competitive play. Uh, I like Corbolo as a character. I think his Warlord trait was cool because um, Gift of Foresight made sense because he could see sort of the future with the lower by having the Red Grail. But I think it, he is he is a healer. He needs to be made a healer, selfless healer. Um, 
needs to to go on to him, I really think. Um, otherwise, we just won't see Carbolo. So Carbolo is number one on this list. So the next one are our Death Company Intercessors, and it's not surprising that they made it onto the list. They get one more attack than a regular uh, Death Company Marine, and for that you pay two additional points. But in picking Death Company Intercessors, you get a slightly better bolt rifle, which is fine. I mean, we've done some maths on bolt rifles versus bolters. Bolt rifles are better, but they're minutely better. Um, and a few extra points here to basically take a guy with a bolt rifle, uh, to me, doesn't seem worth it on a Death Company Marine. There's obviously no way to get them into close combat easily because they don't have jump packs. And let me tell you what else I thought was problematic. So, like I mentioned, two more points per model than Firstborn. And they're, they're so restricted with their close combat options. You know, Death Company are a close combat unit in my opinion. Yes, it's nice that they can take the bolt rifles over bolters for example, but they are a close combat unit, so having a real restrictive way to limit what close combat weapons they can have instantly makes these guys quite a bit lower than firstborn in my opinion. The lack of the jump pack means there's no legitimate way to really get any value out of Forlorn Fury, which is arguably the Death Company's most powerful stratagem. Um, if you have the right combination of characters, like a Sanguary Priest and a Chapter Master, you can essentially give your Death Company complete rerolls and put them in Assault Doctor in turn 1 and get them 12 inches across the board pre-game. That's huge. Uh, it's so powerful and the Death Company Intercessors obviously can't do that at all. I mean, they can get 6 inches across the board, but even then, another 6 is nothing compared to the 12 in the 12 of the Firstborn. They can also only run one Thunderhammer in the entire squad. Uh, even if it's a 10-man squad, and the Thunderhammer here costs more points than what it costs a Firstborn Death Company uh, model to take a Thunderhammer, it is just 5 more points, but I mean you're just getting one more attack, so it seems pretty harsh to charge you 5 more points for one attack, and then like I said, the problem here is, the problem here maybe isn't even the cost of the Thunderhammer, the problem is you can only take one in the squad, whereas a Firstborn uh, squad of Death Company could take 10 Thunderhammers if they want. We usually recommend a ratio of like 4 to 1 or 3 to 1, but even so, this just makes Death Company Intercessors really confused, in my opinion, because the strength of the Death Company is mixing Thunder Hammers, and sometimes Infernal Pistols, they can't even take Infernal Pistols, the Death Company Intercessors. So problems with the limiting of the weapon options for the Intercessors it really doesn't make sense to me. I kind of hate, personally, the limiting or the limits that are placed on Primaris models for weapon options, and in some ways this just makes the Firstborn a lot better. There's no cost-effective way to transport them. Impulsors can only carry 6, and typically for Death Company they'll go 5 or 10, so again if you want to take the Intercessors, you limit yourself to just the 5. Uh, repulsors are way too damn expensive, and um, there's no way that and repulsors aren't even really a transport vehicle, I would argue, because they can only move 10 inches and they're not super survivable. Um, there's no Primaris drop pod, so how you're getting these guys across the battlefield is questionable. Again, this is why I just kind of steer myself away from Death Company Intercessors. And a final question, you know, we've seen a lot of debate recently about like the Tau Railgun and how good that weapon is, and it should be good because it is good in the lore. Well, my question is here is, why is the morale of the Death Company so bad? They're Leadership 7. Uh, aren't they Blood Angels that have gone into complete rage? Basically, any enemies on the board should look like Horus, and they're just going to run towards them and chop them up. So why would they have poor leadership? Nothing is ever making these guys run away. I guess that's a question for, a question for someone to answer in the comments. So... Is there any positives in Death Company Intercessors? I mean, the positives are they get one more attack than the Firstborn variant. They can be run with bolt rifles, but this really does feel like it's clutching at straws because bolt rifles give you like a tiny little bit more damage. Uh, any damage you would gain from the bolt rifles, you'd probably instantly be negated by the fact that your Firstborn would have like a few more Thunder Hammers and once they're in combat and it's much easier to get into the combat. You know, it really does feel like we're clutching at straws here. Um, we also have access to the Primaris stratagems, and there's two that stand out, Transhuman and Gene Rot Might. So Transhuman would be very nice to be able to give Death Company. And Gene Rot Might is just when you roll to hit wound, uh, rolls of a six or an auto wound. 
We don't really have that much problems with wounding, typically. On a firstborn death company with a bunch of thunder hammers, you're probably wounding on twos. Um, so it's really just access to transhuman. In our tierless video, we actually put these low B. Uh, and in my opinion, I actually think these guys are crap. So Tony and Mark might like these guys a little bit more than me. But yeah, I, I think these are... I think Death Company intercessors are crap. I think you avoid them. I think if you want to run Death Company for the foreseeable future, you have to run Firstborn Death Company. <laughs> okay, on to number three. And this is Reavers. And Reavers are a great looking unit. Uh, when you look at their uh, stat line for 18 points per model, they're kind of cheap two wound marines. So that's nice. There's ways for them to deep strike and outflank as well. Uh, reasonably cheap, two points, so one point cheaper than a jump pack here. That's reasonably nice. And then they also can cause enemy units within three to subtract two inches of their leadership um, because of those terror masks they wear. But I've had Reavers painted for a very long time and I found them underwhelming every single time I've used them. No one is running them in your competitive play, and let's go into why. So, for Blood Angels anyway, they take up an elite slot. There's so much competition in elite slots. You know, Dreadnoughts, Vanguard Veterans, Bladeguard Veterans, Sanguary Guard. There's, you know, even a Judas ER, which is a very good character for Blood Angels, is an elite. So there's just far too much competition in elite slots. So Reavers are pushed down because of that. Uh, they are Primaris, and they do have 5 attacks per model on the charge if you are them with the combat knives, but they really struggle to kill things due to the lack of AP. You know, even a basic chainsword has more AP than these guys now. Their pistol is nice, but, you know, the pistol is minus 2, so it is nice, but it's, it's it doesn't have enough shots. You get 5 shots, so even on a Toughness 3 enemy, you can expect them to only have to make, like, a couple of saves. So at best, you're doing, like, 2 damage out of these pistols. So in 9th edition they made their pistol have an additional minus one and they left their knives where they are. I think if they'd gone the other way there, you might have been able to see Reavers, but the way it's gone, um, I think that their damage output is lackluster at best. So I guess there's an argument here that Reavers are not a damaging unit, which is fine, but I mean one of their main things is that they, they mess up your opponent's leadership, right? Leadership um, within... Three inches of the Reavers is minus two, so if the Reavers were able to come in and kill things and make a charge and kill things, then you could potentially see enemies failing leadership, but I was talking about this the other day, I don't know if leadership is so important now in 9th edition. You know, combat attrition is a new mechanic that they put in in 9th, where you basically roll... Um, for every model after one has died on rolls of one and sometimes ones or twos if the squad's at less than half strength with so much minimum strength minimum size units going around combat attrition there's there's often times you would roll for combat attrition and you lose one model or you lose no models so especially with them not killing many the chances of the enemies having to take a leadership test seem low when they do take a leadership test the enemy loses one more model maybe if they're unlucky two or something they're just not good in my opinion uh they do have some positives you know like they are cheap primaris units so they are 18.2 wound infantry marines which you can get on the battlefield they do have a 2 CP terror troops, which can remove obsec from enemies and potentially interrupt enemy actions. And they do have that shock and awe stratagem where they can remove uh, overwatch and make an enemy's chance to hit by minus one. I mean, those are nice stratagems. The other things that that's good for them is they have a cool looking helmet. You can kish, kit bash onto other models, but I realize that doesn't really help the Reavers. They can deep strike for two points per model. It's a shame it's not jump packs. And... Um, yeah, I mean, we put them in the crap tier. I think they are crap. Maybe there's an edge case here where you could make them work, but if you want to get access to Shock and Awe as a Blood Angel player, you'd be much better off taking a Land Speeder Storm. It fills into the fast attack role. It's going to be more mobile, more maneuverable. It's probably going to be a bit more survivable. Um, it's probably going to do just as much, if not more damage than the Reavers and be cheaper. And... I guess that's how you would do that. If you want to remove obsec from enemy models, then you're probably better taking a Warlord with uh, the Warlord trait. I think it's Visage of Death that removes obsec because 
This is going to cost you 2 CP to use it, so arguably you're only going to be able to use it like once per battle, whereas if you give them the Warlord trait for 1 CP you can use it on multiple times, multiple battle rounds. So yeah, for, for me Reavers, they'd need something. Um, they don't do any damage. The utility seems interesting, but other models will do this utility better. So in the tier list we put them in C. My verdict is, yeah, they are a very crap unit. Um, avoid Reavers. If you've got a squad of Reavers, kitbash the helmets. Um, that's the most. That's the coolest thing you can do with the Reavers. Um, because if you, because if you, if you, if like me, you spent time painting these, uh, the chances are that you're just gonna sit on them and never field them. And I think I fielded them like one or two times in the whole edition. And every time I felt fielded them, I just felt they were very, very underwhelming. Let's move on to number four, and that is our Furioso Dreadnought. I remember talking about this in our tier list video, and I was I was actually surprised. I didn't realize initially that this guy didn't get the core keyword, and I think there's no reason that he shouldn't have the core keyword. Um, and also the Magna Grapple in this edition seems confused. Uh, in previous editions, Magna Grapple was a great um, add-on to basically our chapter-specific Dreadnoughts, which people would uh, spend points and use, but we're going to go into that on my next, uh, on, on the discussion slide here in a second, and also the Blood Talons, I got a question, question marks over the Blood Talons as well. So Furioso can get like seven attacks on the charge, so I mean, that sounds pretty interesting, right? But the fact that he can get no rerolls because he's not core is straight away kind of rough because he's on a B BS and WS of three. And even if he was going to use Wisdom of the Ancient, which he can do, you know, because he is a Dreadnought, he can cast Wisdom of the Ancient, then it wouldn't actually ever help him. It wouldn't affect himself. He couldn't get to reroll his ones, which is really disappointing. So what's the problem with the Furioso? Uh, I said it, the lack of the core keyword. Um, other melee Dreadnoughts like the Ironclad contain this, so they're almost instantly better just because they have core. Uh, the Magna Grapple is confused. It was better when it gave a charging bonus against Fear Coals because it meant you could strategically reserve the Dreadnoughts and then get an easier charge when you came in from Deep Strike. That was pretty cool, actually. Um, now what it does is potentially stops enemy vehicles falling back, but vehicles can fire while in close combat now. So you almost you almost give the opponent the, the choice, like, try and fall back and I'll maybe cancel your fallback or just shoot at me in close combat anyway. So it seems a bit strange to pay the points to try and make them stay in close combat and shoot at you anyway, which is probably what they would probably going to be doing anyway. I kind of think this is potentially the worst Dreadnought that we can run this edition. It's worse than the Death Company Dreadnought, it's worse than the Ironclad um, in terms of melee damage, it's worse than regular Chicken Dreadnoughts, and I guess what I mean by Chicken Dreadnoughts are old sort of like standard Dreadnoughts that have like a claw and a multi-melter, um, and it's definitely worse than like a Venerable Dreadnought as well. Blood Talons have a lower AP now, uh, just an AP of minus two, theoretically meaning you're paying 10 points for likely one more hit, um, but at a lower AP. So if you think about it, you get like seven attacks, right? Let's say you hit five times. So if you're on the fists, you'll wound four times, for example, and they'll all be at minus three, three damage. If you're on the talons, maybe you make all your wounds, so it'll be five at minus two, three damage. So potentially there is a chance to do more damage with the talons, but it's one less AP, so arguably make it a little bit easier for the enemy to save. So you're kind of, you're almost paying 10 points for these blood talons for like literally no bonus. I, I'm very confused as why Blood Talons lost an AP this edition. For me, it it really just it makes it makes them feel over costless and worthless. I, I used to run Blood Talons, and I don't run them since we got our new ninth edition codex. Um, what's the positives of Furiosa Dreadnought? I mean, he has seven attacks on the charge with a strength twelve fist and three damage and minus three, but I mean, a regular Chicken Walker Dreadnought could have six attacks on the charge. Um, with the fist and basically it would have a multi melta and it would have the core keyword and basically cost five more points. Um, it's kind of a no-brainer what I would pick there. Uh, and it has eight wounds in Duty Eternal, which all the other Dreadnoughts have anyway. So in our tier list we put the Furioso Dreadnought in crap. My verdict here is actually it's below crap. It's D. It's complete dumpster. Um, it's sad because it's sort of like our 
chapter specific dreadnought i know we've got three but this is a this is a cool model it looks cool people like it it used to be pretty fun with the frag cannon now it is terrible avoid the furiosa dreadnought if you buy the blood angels dreadnought kit build either of the other two avoid this one we're then going to move into what I think is going to be a pretty controversial topic. We're definitely going to see some people in the comments speak about this. I want to say tactical marines are also something you want to avoid right now. And I just think there's about... They used to be 15 points per model. If they stayed at 15 points per model, I could be on board with fielding tactical marines. At 18 points per model, I just think they're too expensive. And obviously we know what tactical marines can do. Like the sergeant can take like a combi weapon, a pistol, a a melee weapon and you can take like one special weapon and you can take one heavy weapon for like the 10 man squad. So everyone is familiar with tacticals. Let me tell you why I don't like them right now. I think 18 points per model is too expensive. You compare them with intercessors who have one more attack per model and a much improved primary weapon with flexible loadouts. And what I mean by that is like a regular bolt rifle gets like six more inches on its range and it also gets one AP. Uh, and they get the one more attack in melee. So it's like their melee is essentially twice as good and their gun is reasonably better as well for two more points it just makes me feel like tacticals are, are too expensive uh, due to lack of attacks i think putting a close combat weapon onto the sergeant just doesn't seem worth it because even the sergeant only gets two attacks and then you have to actually sacrifice firepower to do that whereas like if you want to put a close combat weapon onto an intercessor sergeant he can hold on to his bolt rifle so you can have a bolt rifle and a thunder hammer whereas the tactical marine has to give up his bolt gun to take a to take a thunder hammer or another combat weapon in this case we actually have a situation where like the primaris weapon options are better it doesn't happen very much but uh, it has happened with troops so tactical squads have kind of been left behind there's no survivability stratagems you can play on tactical squads if you talk about like having an obsec unit on an objective that you really need to survive at least if it's an intercessor you can play transhuman if it's a incursor or an infiltrator you can play like both transhuman and smokescreen and if it's like a heavy intercessor then you get there's a gravis strat i think it's called unyielding in the face of the foe so there's loads of stratagems for all the other uh, troops that can boost their survivability and in addition where a lot of your points in every game come from holding objectives with obsec units having access to no survivability stratagems is tragic i hate it i like tactical squads i actually own about five of them five ten man not five five mans five ten mans because i used to play in the older edition of the game but i think i think i've run them once in ninth um and that's the stratagem is probably one of the biggest issues. They were 15 points per model before, and I, I did run them more often when they were 15 each, because the second you start putting like a special weapon or a heavy weapon in, they instantly become as expensive as the Primaris troops, um, or sometimes more expensive. And if you think about it, like let's say you want to put a, a LAS cannon onto your tactical squad, then they're more expensive than incursors that, like I said, have those two survivability stratagems that are going to be really core to you uh, winning or losing a game or holding objectives and what you're going to gain is you're going to have this swingy last cannon like one shot from a last cannon or a three up ballistic skill well if, if if the squad survives the entire game you're going to get like three hits with that last cannon you know you'll probably miss one of the wounds as well so you're basically going to you're going to get two shots from a last cannon for the entire game for a squad that costs more than a survivable mobile really good in close combat primaris squad like i'm sorry if you love tactical squads I hate being the bearer of bad news. I just and and some people love the Blood Angel specific tactical squad. You really have to avoid them at the moment. Buy them, make them, uh, put them on your shelf for a future edition, hopefully. Uh, but right now the rules for me are not good. What's the positives? I mean, they can be transported in larger squads on six. That's cool. They have the metal bombs keyword, which I actually really like as well. I think the metal bombs keyword is the only reason that I've said that they're crap and I haven't put in them in the dumpster tier. And they have obsec as well. Um, but I mean, like I said, the other troops have obsec as well. So uh, tier list position for us for this was a C in my verdict because yeah, tactical squads are just crap right now. You need to avoid them. Okay, and then our final unit for today is going to be the Sanguinor. And some people have been running the Sanguinor and some people have had a little bit of success with it. But I want to give you my opinion on, on him and why... And why I think this character is actually in a position where he could have been really interesting and really fun to play and possibly a real big threat. 
However, his rules just slightly miss the mark. So I wanted to talk about why I think his rules miss the mark this edition and how, if it was up to me, how I would change them to make him that his rules were really interesting. I wanted to throw on record, in 8th edition, the Sanguinor was the character I ran all the time. I never ran Dante in 8th edition, I ran the Sanguinor because his aura of plus one attack around him was awesome and... Okay, let's get into my slide uh, about why I don't like the Sanguinor right now. So his aura has become a ton weaker and arguably almost worthless. Like 95% of combats uh, in all of 9th edition seem to be over in a single round of combat. Very rarely do units uh, linger on for multiple rounds and the Sanguinor's aura doesn't stack with Shock Assault. Previous editions it just stacked. It was just one attack, which was brilliant. Um, obviously he doesn't give re-rolls like a captain or something, he gave you one extra attack and that was, you were sort of trading off that one extra attack against the fact that he gave you no re-rolls. So yeah, it seems, it seems, it seems rubbish. Uh, you charge your unit in, I've talked often on this channel about how squishy Sanguinary Guard are, so your Sanguinary Guard charge in, they either kill everything or they get killed. There's not really going to be a second round of combat and if the enemy are still in combat with the Sanguinary Guard, Chances are they're probably going to fall back and have another unit shoot them off the table because Sanguinary Guard aren't that survivable at sh being shot. So Sanguinary's aura is very, very weak. I don't know why it couldn't stack with Shock Assault. I feel like you're paying 150 points for this character. He's giving no reroll, so plus one attack would have been fine. I don't get it. Uh, number two is his Warlord trait is basically of no value. So his Warlord trait gives him additional range on reroll auras, but he doesn't give any reroll auras, so that half of the Warlord trait does nothing. Um, and then the second part of the trait, in the previous edition, it was just that if you're within six inches of the Sanguinar, you auto pass morale. Now it's basically uh, plus one to your leadership within nine inches. But like with the combat attrition rules on Space Marines, um, and like I really do feel like leadership is low value in that I take Oath of Moment in almost every game because you get one point in every turn you either don't fall back and don't fail leadership test and because we've got no fallback in charge and because we have really high leadership as Space Marines usually I would say 8 out of 10 games you get the full 5 points 2 times out of 10 you maybe fail 1 leadership test so you get 4 points so I think that like a plus 1 to leadership with a 9 is going to maybe, like one in every 10 games, it's going to save a unit. It's so low value. And so other part of heroic bearing, like doesn't help him at all. So his warlord trait is like, it's like bottom of the barrel here. It's worth, it's completely worthless. I would never, ever pick this guy as your warlord. However, I feel like this is really like a missed opportunity because if he was given gift of foresight, along with the miraculous savior rule, which is he can re come into the battle uh, when the enemy charges you and then he could angel sacrifice to, sh to force an enemy to hit him a bunch of times and then to get that free save re-roll I think that would have been huge he's got four up and vulnerable saves so being able to re-roll one save for free as long as as well as CPing a save that could have been super interesting Sanguinar could have been top tier we could have seen him loads but unfortunately not um like all Firstborn, he has no access to any survivability stratagems, except maybe like a command point reroll that I just mentioned, uh, which is the same problem with the Sanguary Guard, and I actually think that kind of hurts Blood Angels a lot, this edition. Uh, Transhuman used to be able to be played on any Marine unit, but now in ninth, it's just Primaris, and because we need to use so many Firstborn models, uh, it's kind of it's kind of rough. And then, you know, the Sanguary has no ranged weapon bar the grenade, which is fine, he's never had a ranged weapon bar grenade, so you do get, you know, random crack grenades that you throw here and there, but 150 points for a 5 wound toughness 4 model is a lot to lose when he can be obliterated in a single shot from like a Meltagon or something like that, you know, like it's very easy to lose a toughness 4 marine, you get wounded on 2s, plague burst crawlers, if he's ever left in the open, yeah, you know, um, 150 points is a lot. Uh, so what's the positives of the Sanguinar? Well, he's minus one to be hit in melee combat. Uh, I think he's the only Blood Angels unit that can fall back and charge. But I mean, a random question about that is why do we not have any stratagems that let us either fall back or charge or fight twice or anything exciting like that 
in ninth, we used to have a great stratagem last edition where we could give a character bonus attacks um, when they charged. I think it was called the Red Thirst or Red Rampage, maybe. Uh, but yeah, we don't have anything like that right now. But he can arrive from Deep Strike and save a squad. But this is going to be very costly if you can try and do that, right? Because you arrive from Deep Strike, you can pay Angel Sacrifice to force the enemies to hit you, and then you could basically either just die, um, or you have to pay some command points to try and do some rerolls. And then I guess you could fight on death. So you're talking about like potentially 3 CP to save a squad and 150 points. I mean, that's very expensive. That's why I think that um, Gift of Foresight could be interesting here, because if you could save the squad for 1 CP or even 2 CP, that'd be decent. But 3 is it's a lot in an addition where it feels like CP are very, very important as a Blood Angel player. We need them. Uh, we need we need to be spending them to keep our stuff alive because it feels like everything is very squishy. Two wound marines die very easily, so it's, it's positive he can he can save a squad. It's negative that it's just going to cost you so much. And then his sword can essentially do one mortal wound each round of combat because he has like seven attacks and. He does mortal wounds on wound rolls of sixes, and he's got that two up B uh, WS. So, kind of one damage, one mortal wound every round of combat is okay. Again, it's okay if you look at some of the other characters that are in the current meta. You have orc characters doing three mortal wounds on every six. So one is okay. Um, in our tier list, we put him in the B tier, and we put him pretty near the top. He was highish B. My verdict is, yeah, he's B, he, he's badish. I mean, I don't see a reason that I would ever include him as he is at 150 points. I don't think we've seen a single competitive list in the whole of 2021 win a tournament or even come close to the top of the tournament with the Sanguiner in the list. So, as with Corbolo, this is a character that just missed the mark needs a bit of a rethink um, and this is obviously my opinion on these six. So thank you so much for watching the end of the video, I really appreciate you guys that do that week in, week out. If you do have any questions please leave them down in the comments section below. You can also follow us now on the official Blood Angels Commander Facebook page, you'll get all the updates whenever we post some new content. And we've had a lot of new subscribers over the last few weeks, so what I'm going to do today is recommend you check out this video up here, and if you do want to see more Blood Angels content, remember you are also very welcome to subscribe. I hope you have a great week, I'll catch you soon enough, thanks again for watching, by the blood are we made strong brothers, peace.